Delighted to have Dr. Paula Noble, who is a professor in the Department of Geological Sciences and Engineering at the University of Nevada, Reno. Paula has worked for over 30 years on radiolarians, which are another uh, organism, a protist that uses silica in their um, bodies. Paula has used the radiolarians primarily to understand biostratigraphy. And I met Paula when she came to Iowa Lakeside Lab and she said something like she'd worked on radiolarians forever and she wanted to learn something new. And so she added uh, diatoms to her skill sets. And now she um, continues to work on large geologic time scales from millions of years to more recent environmental change in lakes using diatoms and the diatom record. So today, Paula will present um, use of monitoring data to inform paleolimnological records and examples from two lakes in Northern Colorado. Northern California, sorry. <laughs> um, thank you, Paula. Thank you, Sarah. Can you all hear me? Okay, good. So I'm gonna rely on you, Sarah, if there's any questions out there, I'm not going to look at the chat box because I'm working off of a little tiny laptop and I'm actually going to shut down all of the, um, the thumbnail video so I can't see any of you anymore and and launch sounds, into this. Sounds talk. good. I'll keep an so, eye out. Yeah, just shout if anything comes up and I'll go ahead and stop. All right. So as Sarah said, I worked on siliceous microfossils for my career. And as a paleontologist, whether I'm dealing with either deep time or the last 10,000 years, one of the things that I'm always trying to do is try to squeeze as much information as I can out of the, the fossil assemblages that I'm working on. And so when you're dealing with lake core records in paleolimnology, one of the challenges is to try and get back to all of the forcing variables and the factors that are affecting those systems, whether it be climate or human activities or a whole variety of properties that are associated with the aquatic environment and the watershed. Uh, and then trying to peel back all of these various filtering effects that can dampen those signals, mute those signals and create leads and lags and when those signals might show up. So that's, that's really our job to, to try and interpret these signals. And in some cases, we're lucky enough to have some modern data that can help us with that. So for those of you who perhaps um, don't work on lake core records, I just wanted to go through the practice that we do in our lab and in many labs to try and generate this type of diatom data. And much of it is done through the enumeration process of strewn slides, where hopefully you have a, a random distribution of diatoms and you can produce fixed counts, generally somewhere on the order of about 500 valves. And these counts can be relative, so you're reporting relative abundance in the end. Uh, or you can maybe take a little bit extra time when you're preparing your sample by using a spike of either microspheres or like a podium uh, pollen to, to try and get at absolute numbers relative to a, a certain unit of sediment. Uh, but rarely do you see stratified counts or counts towards completion to try and get at the true biodiversity of a sample because many times you're dealing with hundreds of species, many of which are rare in a sample. And when you're counting 500 units and you have 250 species per se, the chances of actually getting all of them in a, in a particular sample are, are not great. So the, the counts that we produce, even though cumulatively by counting everything in the lake, we might hit the entire biodiversity. In, in a given sample, really what we're picking out are the big signals. And these are the, 
the most abundant species. Many times you see large changes in species dominant. You might get half a dozen species out of that 250 that uh, have enough valves uh, over 1% to actually show up. So that's an important thing to remember. Um, sometimes we can calibrate that, whether we're using modern training sets and inference models developed from that, whether we're using the published literature or whether we're actually using data that was collected from the modern in that system. So I think the key question here, the thing that I'm always trying to, to wonder about when I do modern sampling is how much of that modern signal is lost in the paleo limnological record? And are there any small bits of signal that normally you would ignore just because it's, it's very subtle uh, that might actually be very important and that you might be overlooking? You know, maybe one of those very low abundance taxa is very significant in telling you some aspect of the forcing variables in that watershed. And then finally, if in fact you can start to pick out some of these small signals, what can we do in the future with our methods to perhaps tease them out a little bit better? So I'll begin by talking about Castle Lake. This is a lake that we cored back in 2017. We took a gravity core and it's not a, a terribly long record. It only goes back 450 years. But one of the cool things about Castle Lake is it has been a biological research station associated with UC Davis and the University of Nevada going back to 1959 when Charlie Goldman of Lake Tahoe fame began going up there and doing sampling, running experiments, and then taking all sorts of students up there for many, many years. So the data set is not completely continuous, but there have been observations, measurements that have been taken throughout this time. And in particular, in the 1960s, there's some very high quality data from the phytoplankton that I'll be referring to today. So Castle Lake is found in the northernmost part of California. It's in the Trinity Alps, and it's close to Lake Shasta. So if you look at the picture in the lower left, we're looking down into the watershed, and it's a small glacially derived cirque lake. And you can see Shasta in the background here to the north about five miles away. So this little glacial lake, it has a deep spot on the southernmost end. And if you look at the bathymetry in the central picture, the deep area is, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but it's basically under the word Castle Lake. And uh, then there's a fairly large littoral area. The deep area is about 35 meters. And then a good deal of the lake is just on the scale of uh, six or seven meters depth. It's a, a fairly clear lake. It is sub-oligotrophic to mesotrophic, so secchi depths on the, on the scale of you know, 10, 12 meters. And so you actually get a, a lot of this lake that's in the photic zone. In terms of the, the limnology, this lake is dimictic, so we do get ice in the winter, and ice out occurs uh, based on the, the ice out data that we have on the lake, which goes from 1962 to 2013. The earliest ice out date was in late April, and then the latest one was the 5th of July. So we have about a two month window in which that occurs. And that of course affects the spring bloom quite profoundly in terms of the length of the growing season. And some work that was done by JASB showed that about 60% of the variance in the primary productivity was associated with the ice out date. And then of course the winter precipitation that is associated with that as well. And just the figure on the right, this is from a 1998 JASB paper. And it shows that there's a deep chlorophyll maximum, it's about 20 meters. And in the spring, we have the center of that with a high primary productivity. And then there's another spike that occurs uh, up in the epilimnion in the late summer. And then the stratification period is shown by the upper figure here. Uh, so we start stratifying sometime after ice out, and then it continues into 
the early fall sometime in September and after that we start getting storms that can start to homogenize the lake and break up the stratification. So here's the diatom record from that little gravity core that we have. And we have our, our relative counts plotted here out of 500 valves. And there's a cluster dendrogram on the far right showing that there were three stratigraphically significant clusters that we were able to break out. And the lowest one is what we're interpreting to represent the Little Ice Age, which was useful because uh, there have been questions as to how extensive this manifests throughout Western North America. In the Sierra Nevada, we have a neoglacial advance with the Matthews glaciers in the alpine environment, uh, but it wasn't really clear if that extended uh, throughout the region. And here we see that we do have that influence and the, the timing is, is a little rough at the bottom of the core. The age model was based on a combination of fallout radionuclides for the top, lead 210, cesium, uh, and then a couple of carbon-14 ages. So the bottom is a, a little bit squishy on the age model, but nonetheless, it seems to be consistent. And the actual diatom signal that we're seeing is a change in uh, phytoplankton, mostly Discostella stelligera, and uh, an increase uh, in uh, the some of the benthic forms, benthic colonial arephids, such as star syrapinata, which seem to be uh, much more prevalent here in the bottom. So another major feature that we see is at the top of the core, and this is what we're calling the anthropogenic zone. We're seeing the occurrence and abundance of a number of phytoplankton arephid types, such as uh, the fragile area Tenera group or Sanita radians is how it was enumerated in the, the Castle Lake data. Uh, and Asterionella formosa, these are, these are forms that uh, have in the past have been tied into uh, atmospheric nitrogen deposition, particularly in systems like Castle that is nitrogen um, uh, limited and, and it can be stimulated through, through nitrogen additions. So that, that seems to be a, a reasonable interpretation associated with the lake. Uh, there has been some question um, as to whether some of these arephids might be related in part to global warming. And in this case, we looked at whatever available meteorological data and ice out data, and we did not see a trend in increasing air temperature, nor in, uh, any kind of significant change in having a progressively earlier ice out date. So uh, it seems like the end deposition explanation for these arephids might be might be a, a, a good one here, at least in this system. Um, what I also have on this figure is this little gray area, and this is the period from which we have good monitoring data from 1967 to 1983. And so this is nice because this is the change from one zone to another, and this would be a good place to see if we might be able to, to tease out a little bit more information. So let's look at the monitoring data. So I've picked three different years to show you. These are the first three years that Charlie Goldman took the data from 1967 through 1969. And we are looking at the three most common phytoplankton that are showing up in these. Now these data were taken every single week. This amazes me. He has five discrete depths that he would sample through the ice in the winter using a, a Van Dorn sample. And then they would enumerate this data and they were reported in bio volume as well as cell counts. And it's uh, both diatom and non-diatom data. So if anyone is interested, we do have a paper out with the supplemental data in there. You can get a hold of that uh, to play with it. So what we're seeing with this is uh, luckily for us, 1968 had an ice out date that was a month different from the previous and the one after. So this was May 2nd. And then if we go to 1969, it was a full month later. So this is an early ice out date associated with less precipitation. And if you look at Disco Stella, it seems that the early ice out date is associated with more Disco Stella. In particular, they are most common in the epilimnion. So this green and blue represent samples at three and 10 meters depth. And I should point out that these are uh, valve counts per unit of water. So th this is absolute abundance. This is not relative abundance that's being shown here. 
So this increase in discus stella with a longer growing season is something that is consistent with reports in the literature. For example, there's a paper uh, that was out talking about the boreal Canadian lakes and that there seemed to be a correlation between decreased ice cover, increased temperature, and increased decidolagera. So here's a cautionary note for you. If you take those same data and rather than take the absolute numbers through the, the counts in the water, and instead you just look at relative abundance and you plot it against ice out and you run a Pearson correlation, what you see is actually that relationship is inverted. So here, what we are seeing is with the relative abundance of Stelligera, when that goes up, it seems to be tied into later ice out, which would actually be um, more ice cover in a shorter growing system season. So it actually is showing the opposite, but this is relative abundance data from the modern, and this would be similar to the type of data that we would collect in a core, relative abundance data, unless you're actually adding the little spheres in there. And what we believe is going on here is that commensurate with these changes in Discostella, we also have some changes in these other common phytoplankton that seem to have a negative relationship, even though the correlation isn't significant uh, to ice out and Asterionella formosa and Fragilaria tenaria with ice out. Still, it seems to be doing the opposite thing as Discostella. And so these increases can actually depress uh, the D. stelligera and give us this opposite view. So keeping this in mind, if we go back to our sediment core and we look at this anthropogenic zone, we see Discostella stelligera decreasing. So if the interpretation is that uh, the abundance of Discostella is related to ice cover, and growing season, this would suggest that we had a shorter growing season, except we know that that's really not what's going on here. If anything, it should be the other way around with warming. Uh, and instead, this signal is actually being driven by upticks in some of these other taxa. So that can really uh, affect how you view these data. So there's one quirky thing I wanna talk about Castle Lake before I move on and talk about the other lake. And that has to do with some of the license that these guys took in the good old days at these biological research, uh, research stations. Uh, we would never do these things today. It just um, just really blows my mind. They, they performed this whole lake epilimnial experiment and this nitrogen limited system just to see what would happen. They went out two years in a row in 1980 and 1981 with a tanker truck full of fertilizer, ammonium nitrate, and they just sprayed it all over the lake. <laughs> and then they ran a, a whole bunch of um, mesocosm experiments just to see what would happen. And over the course of the next month, they saw that this nitrogen indeed was taken up uh, there was a depletion of 35 micrograms of NO3 per liter. And where did it go? They had hypothesized that it would result in phytoplankton blooms and loss of water clarity. But in fact, the phytoplankton did not do as good a job in taking up the nitrogen as the, the what they're calling the periophyton, which most of us would, would call benthic algae called the littoral species. And remember, there's a large littoral zone here, uh, fairly clear. And they found that a lot of this activity was by epipilic forms and some of the sediment. So this was interesting that you had this huge response. This actually informed a lot of the, the literature that followed up at Lake Tahoe. The same research group moved up into to Tahoe proper to work. And today, uh, concerns about water clarity in Tahoe and what's happening with eutrophication through storm runoff is associated with uptick in periphyton that is occurring around the lake. So this seemed to be a really bizarre thing to do. And we were hoping that we might be able to see this experiment run 40 odd years ago in the sediment core. Here's the sedimentary geochemistry. 
we ran carbon and nitrogen isotopes. And with that, you get weight percent carbon and nitrogen. And on the left, if you just look at the nitrogen, this gray area here represents what, based on our lead 210 and cesium age model, this is what we interpret to be that experiment, where you actually get this little spike in the weight percent nitrogen, and also you see a change in the del N15, which might indicate a change in source between the typical source, the natural sources, and then this tanker truck full of fertilizer. So we do see a signal geochemist geochemically, but what about the diatoms? On the left are monitoring data, and these are uh, relative abundances, I believe, actually, um, which I guess we should look with caution. But these are these are abundance counts from the monitoring data. And look at the upper two here, because these are associated with the experiment. Here's 1980, um, we have star Sorella pinnata, and then 81, we have this spike in Tabularia fenestrata. What's really interesting to me is these numbers are huge. We're looking, Fenestrata is only 8%, but still the base level there, it was pretty much negligible in the counts until this experiment. And the same thing is true with Panada, where it's negligible in the phytoplankton samples until this experiment. Now, both of these forms are colonial eraphids that can be very happy in littoral zones, but also can get entrained in the water column and float out and end up in your plankton toes. So it's no surprise if most of that nitrogen is being picked up by the periphyton growth that some of that ends up in our phytoplankton counts. So do we see that in the core? If we go back to our, our image of our core, the answer is mm, not really. We're in this gray zone here, somewhere in the middle. And if anything, there's maybe a, a slight bump of maybe a percentage of Tabularia fenestrata. Uh, we see some changes with Storosorella uh, pinnata over here, but these changes seem to start earlier. And so this is a signal, even though it was an enormous experiment, this is a signal that really is just not showing up, at least in terms of these relative abundance counts. There's one other thing that I wanted to pick out of the monitoring data before I move on and talk about uh, the other lake, Fallen Leaf Lake, and that is this lower figure here. This is the counts from the monitoring data of Fragilaria tenera, and this interval that goes from 1967 to 1983 it represents two sections of core in our core, and it happens to coincide with this maximum bump in the same taxa that we're counting. So we're seeing it in the core, and we're seeing it in the monitoring record. But what's interesting to me is that the shape of it is U-shaped in the monitoring, where we go from some very high numbers, really high, down to practically nothing. And the way that is smoothed out and averaged in the core in two samples just creates this hump. And it makes it look like some kind of a gradual progression and maybe some kind of a tailing off and then something else taking over here, Asteria nella formosa. When in actuality, it looks like this increase in Tenera over time happened in spurts and fits as it kind of puttered along and kicked in with a lot of interannual va uh, variation that we're just not picking up. Now, maybe we're never going to capture this in the core, but at least from a process standpoint, which is good for my brain, it helps us really understand how these systems kind of transfer from one, um, one state to another. Okay, I'm just going to check the time here. Okay, great. So now I want to move down into the Sierra Nevada to the Lake Tahoe Basin and talk about some data that comes from Fallen Leaf Lake, which is actually my first Holocene paleolinology project that I started. And I went out in 2009 and I began collecting limnological data and then in 2010, we got a whole suite of lake cores for the Holocene, had a couple of students and we worked on those and uh, have a, a whole array of papers that come out of there. But I wanna take you back to some of that early data that I collected from the limnology and then try and tie it into some of the signals that we saw later. So Fallen Leaf Lake uh, is actually, sorry, the arrows are moved a little bit, but it's this lake right here under the black arrow. 
It's in the southern end of the Lake Tahoe watershed. And this lake is a couple kilometers long, kilometer wide. It's formed in a glacial valley. So if you look at this swath bathymetry over here, this um, kind of oblique view, it's the direction of this orange arrow. You can see fallen leaf lake sitting up here. And it is dammed on the northern end by a series of terminal moraines as the glaciers receded. And it was formed during the late Tauyoga retreat, so 15 or 16,000 years ago. And it's a really great Holocene record that is just full of diatoms. The lake itself is fairly deep. It has a, a sufficient thermal mass so that it doesn't ice over in the winter and it's monomictic. And it doesn't have a huge shallow littoral zone like Castle Lake just because of its depth. Uh, the mean depth is about 70 meters, but this the uh, northern end is in fact shallower. Something interesting about this is that the base level of Fallen Leaf Lake is 50 meters above the base level of Lake Tahoe. And so this indicates a potential climate sensitivity so that if you have hydrologic deficits over the span of multiple years, you can effectively lower the lake level by reducing the inflows because most of the inflows, about 80% of the water entering the system is through snowpack and runoff from the melt of that snow. So this little diagram on the bottom is a cross section from south to north showing the full base level where Fallen Leaf Lake is today, but in a droughty interval, perhaps uh, centennial scale droughts, we could then drop that base level down here. And in fact, in Fallen Leaf Lake at about 30 meters depth, 25, 30 meters, there's a flat shelf where we have all sorts of in-place tree stumps. Many of these trees have been dated and some of them date back to the medieval climate anomaly. Others date back into earlier intervals of aridity that occurred in the late Holocene. So it provides an interesting place to test the idea of climate sensitivity. So I'm gonna skip over this slide because I've actually mentioned a bunch of this stuff and jump into the limnology data. And these diagrams here are depth, time, uh, isoplex showing the concentrations of total diatoms collected using a similar method that Charlie Goldman used in Castle Lake, where I went out every month, this is 2009, I went out every month for six months, starting in early June, when stratification was just starting, and used a Van Dorn to collect diatoms and water quality data from 12 depths from zero to 50 meters. And it was enough of a grid that I could actually plot it and make these diagrams. So this is diatom dominated, there's a deep chlorophyll maximum that in 2009 was about 40, 40 meters. Uh, in 2011, we got a little bit more snow and that rose up to about 30 meters. So it varies a little bit. And then there's a seasonal succession. We can see that uh, in both the epilimnion and then uh, as time goes on and we push down some of those epilimnial forms or the surface forms into this deep chlorophyll maximum, uh, we can also see a succession there as well. And then for the three years for which I did this type of sampling, we saw some interannual variation where this particular year, T. flocculosa, 3P, which is a planktonic strain of this form shown here in the far lower left. This was the dominant one, but then other years like 2011, we had a lot of fragile area. It's one thing that was interesting to me that I thought might be able to be taken back into the cores was looking at two different species of Lindavia, uh, Lindavia rossii, which is kind of a messy species complex. It includes uh, tripartite forms, ocellate forms, a variety of sizes. It could be multiple things, but this guy is living in the lake. Through our sampling uh, in the Van Dorns, we were capturing material and we could tell what was live and what was dead. So we were able to distinguish what was living in the lake and what was washed in from the upper part of the watershed, which is actually pretty substantial. So this one is endemic to Fallen Leaf Lake and it's, I haven't seen it in the lakes above it. Lindavia bodanica is also present in Fallen Leaf Lake and it's a summer epilimnial specialist. So by the time you get into August and you look at water samples in the upper 10 meters, there's really no diatoms in it except for this one. And they're not in great abundance, but that's all there is. So I thought this was interesting, this 
spatial or vertical partitioning based on, on different species of Lindavia that are living in the lake. And here is a comparison of water samples that were taken at the start of stratification on the 1st of June. And so this is a little flake model showing the stratification of the lake. So it would be right here, this first sample. And then in late September at the end of stratification, shown by this little arrow here. And if we compare for discrete water samples from zero, 10, 20, 50 meters depth, we take that water sample and we just do a relative count of these two taxa, we see that in the spring, we actually have a pretty substantial um, dominance collectively of uh, Lindavia rossii. Even though the upper two samples, it's more or less sub-equal, Rossii represents a larger component here than, for instance, if we go to the late summer sample where the Danica is just dominating in those upper samples. Now, how would this show up in the sediment? Well, I took a vertical plankton toe and I also did the ratios and I thought the this composite toe of the whole water column might be representative of white might end up in the sediment and what kind of a signal we had. And sure enough, the spring, we showed this dominance of Rossii in the composite toe. And then in the fall, we have the dominance of the Danica. So now let's move forward into a sediment layer where we have maybe eight or 10 years. We have the whole season compacted. And my thought was, if we have changes in winter precipitation that might affect the length of the stratification season, would this in fact result in changes in the relative abundance of these two species? So could we play with this ratio and use this as some kind of a proxy for stratification? So keep that in mind, we'll see if it works. Short answer is, oh, <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> Another thing that I did in addition to that monitoring is I went up and sampled the watershed to see who is living where. And this was helpful because these are the centric taxa, just using the, the centric phytoplankton as an example. These are the ones that are endemic to fallen leaf lake and they're not found in the upper watershed in these smaller, shallower water bodies. But there are other lakes such as Gilmore and Susie Lake where these things are dominated by short mantle Dilacosyra, such as Dilacosyra priscilla and Discostella stelligera. And in fact, these two are entering into Fallen Leet Lake and they are a large part of the sediment core, but they are washed in species, or at least in the present day, they're not living there. Maybe in the past, uh, having high numbers of these guys in the core might suggest that conditions that favor them in the upper watershed were actually present in Fallen Leaf Lake. Okay, so let me show you a little bit of core data from Fallen Leaf Lake. This is the last uh, 4,500 years, so the late Holocene. These are diatom counts. Some of them were done by a former student, Laurel Stratton. And uh, I filled in some of her data and she initially did 200 counts. I took them up to 500. So we have some big signals here. The biggest is right here at 3.65 thousand years ago. In fact, this is the biggest signal in the entire Holocene. The next biggest signal in these cores is the Holocene Pleistocene transition. And then the third biggest signal is actually that anthropogenic zone, which is not shown in this diagram. It's uh, in the gravity core that is a companion to this one. This change is so big that if you just look at the slides, if you look on the left, you can tell. Down here, we're dominated by Alacosiris of Arctica. And we can actually see this in the proxy record for opal silica. So on the far right, this is scanning XRF data showing a ratio of silica normalized to titanium. And you can see this big blip in this blue area represents this lower zone here. So we're seeing it in the sedimentary geochemistry. Uh, there's changes in the uh, del C13, uh, about a two per mil change. So there's definitely some, some things going on in this lake. So what could that mean? Uh, we have some good information on Alacosiris subarctica. We know that it's a fairly heavy, well silicified species. It requires turbulence. Uh, there have been some, some publications that suggest with extended ice cover, we might actually suppress this because we don't have the ability to keep it suspended. Uh, so it seems to be something um, that would be very happy in a more mesotrophic system. 
where we have a constant constant wind and constant um, breakdown of stratification to keep that in there in, in the um, in the water column. So this is a map of the pyramid and Lake Tahoe watershed. Fallen Leaf Lake is up here in the alpine environment, but this is all connected. So Lake Tahoe spills into the Truckee River. There's a five meter sill, and as long as Lake Tahoe doesn't evaporate below that, we continue to provide water into this terminal basin, Pyramid Lake. And then this is actually a double lake basin. Over here is Winnemucca Dry Lake, which in, until um, 100 years ago um, and some damming, there was actually water in here. And these lake systems are sensitive to lake level changes and work by my colleague Ken Adams at DRI and some of his, his co-authors using lake shore lines um, have, have been very useful in showing lake level change throughout the late Pleistocene and Holocene. And on the right is an aerial photo of this northern area of Winnemucca Dry Lake from his 2008 paper, I think it is. And he has carbon-14 dates. Two years ago, they put out another paper with OSL dates. So they have a really good record of the change. And the sensitivity here, uh, the amount of change you can see uh, has to do with a couple of sills. One of them is the one that allows water to spill from Pyramid into Winnemucca Dry Lake. So once you reach that level, you start seeing changes here. And then if you go even higher to 1,200 meters, Pyramid Lake would then start spilling to the north through Emerson Pass. And at that point, you're not going to see any higher lake levels in Winnemucca. So that's about a 25 meter change that you could get. And that is what's recorded here. And from these data, and also from archaeological sites around Pyramid Lake, Ken Adams was able to reconstruct a lake level curve, which is extremely useful because since this is the same system as Fallen Leaf Lake, there's really just one solution to changes in lake level rises and falls. If we see a change here, then we should expect some kind of change to manifest in the alpine end of the system. So here is Ken Adams lake level curve. And if we're gonna compare it to our core data, we're gonna just look at this part here from 4.5 onward. And this humpy area here is the neopluvial. So this is a, a period, uh, there's, there's not glacial advancement, but the Great Basin was wetter. So it wasn't necessarily colder and wetter, but there was more precipitation. So going back to our diatom, slide showing all of our enumerations, I've superimposed different climate intervals that are recognized throughout the Great Basin and the Sierra Nevada. These are the big ones. Here's the neopluvial, which corresponds very nicely with our big change in Alakasara. The late Holocene dry period, which has been recognized in many pollen records, would go in here if we were to see it in the core, and I say if. Medieval climate anomaly, which my former student Laurel Stratton tried very hard to see in Fallen Leaf Lake, and then the little ice age up here. So what signals do we actually see in the core uh, in terms of the, the wetter ones versus the drier ones? The subalpine environment is much more sensitive to the wetter ones. And that makes sense because what influences this area largely is associated with snowpack and winter precipitation. And if you want to add in ice cover, perhaps in the past when Fallen Leaf Lake might have iced over, uh, then you can potentially affect things such as uh, Alakasaira and uh, creating other um, factors such as growing season uh, that you would get with this, this winter ice cover. So the neopluvial uh, pluvial shows up. Uh, we see the little ice age showing up with this modest spike here in Stephanodiscus medius. It's a cold water Stephanodiscus species. It's pretty much absent until we see the little ice age. This is a really good thing for correlating our different cores in the lake because of that datum. So those sh things show up well. What's also plotted on here besides some of the, the most abundant species are the ratios that I noticed in the monitoring data. So here's the ratio of Lindavia botanica to Rossii, and then Alakasaira high mantle to low mantle. Now keep in mind, this is relative abundance data, and we've already discussed how you can really 
change the direction of that signal uh, by not using absolute counts, but nonetheless, I, I had to do it. And, and those are the, the data I had. In addition, in, in addition to this, I threw in a couple of transect counts where I only counted the two Lindavia species against each other. And I put averages of those numbers just to see how this ratio would show up. Uh, indeed, if you ignore all of the Alacosira and the neopluvial samples and you just count the Lindavias, Bodanica is very rare. And a count of 200, I think I had one, one valve of Bodanica. So it's mostly Rossii down here. And as we moved up, we saw some variation in it, but other than this change from the neopluvial, this is not very robust. There's a lot of signal. Uh, it's not really clear how much of this is controlled by the relative abundance of other, other taxa in the core. And part of the problem is that in general, Rossii tends to swamp the Danica in terms of relative abundance. So perhaps in the future, to try and do something like, like this in another lake, finding two species that were um, more close in their relative abundance might, might be better. Here we're, we're dealing with really small numbers of Bodanica where the maximum abundance in a sample might be one or 2%. So, uh, what can we possibly take away from some of these data? Uh, first of all, as paleolimnologists, we're always going to be trying to push the limits and interpret those records as responsibly as we can without being accused of over-interpreting our data. Uh, but we also have to realize that a lot of this interannual variability, such as what we saw with the Castle Lake system, is just not going to show up, or it's just going to be highly smooth. I think just having that general awareness may be helpful in going forth, forward and informing us on what processes are affecting these systems. Um, this one was an eye opener for me because I admit it, all of my samples that I run, I do not spike. I use relative abundance counts. Uh, but however, in the future, one of the things that I think I would like to start doing, this is something I did with my radiolarian work, with my recent PhD student, Sarah Trubovitz, is instead of just doing fixed counts, doing something uh, where we can perhaps try and capture the species richness and the dominance through getting the uh, biodiversity in a sample. And this can be done either through stratified counts, which have been described in the literature, in the diatom literature, or in the case of what Sarah did with the radiolarians, which are also very speciose. She had about 300 or 400 species in a given sample from the Eastern Equatorial Pacific. Uh, she used a completion curve. So this would actually use some, some quantitative methods to determine at what point in time you're likely to get a new species added based on uh, your, your counting sequence. And when this curve started to flatten and it looked like the chance of doing another 100 counts is not gonna give you any more taxa, then she would stop. She would usually shoot for about 90% completion. And in her case, she was counting upwards of 4,000 valves, which is a scary thought when you consider the time involved in that. So there's some ways to, to um, avoid having to count every valve by uh, skipping over some of the, the more abundant ones. There's software out there, such as a program called Raritars, developed by a colleague, a radiolarian colleague, David Lazarus in Berlin. And I would be very curious to use that to see if we can start getting some of this community structure data is just another metric that we can use in the paleolimnology uh, records to try and tease out some of these really subtle signals. So I'm gonna stop sharing, uh, that's all I got. And I really thank you for asking me to come here and talk to you today. Thank you so much, Paula. Um, really a fantastic record in both of these lakes and um, really intriguing, um, really enjoyed your talk. In fact, I feel like I wanna hog all the questions, but I, I don't have any of the answers though. <laughs> set a time to talk to you because I've been taking notes the whole time. Um, yeah, this, I mean, if people want to start put, um, raising their hand or um, here we go, put questions in the chat. Um,
let's see, Mark says, I wish I was a geologist question. Why does the silica to titanium ratio change with a shift from Olicocyra subarctica to Lindavia species? Is it a diatom response or a watershed response? I think it is a fallen leaf lake response. I think we are looking at increased in lake productivity in the neopluvial period. Uh, of course, you have to have the silica coming from somewhere. So maybe all of that silica is coming out of the watershed with the extra rain and snow. Uh, but we do see um, higher sedimentation rates, which is not something I mentioned. The sedimentation rates in the neopluvial are a little bit higher. The sediment becomes more condensed above it. Okay. Um, people are still formulating your questions. Um, I thought it was really interesting, Paula, that it seems like your record is sensitive to wet seasons. That's the biggest marker of when you see a big change, but not the, the opposite. Um, what do you make of that? And what do you think is gonna happen now when the watersheds around all these lakes have just been torched and filled with ash from fires in the last um, couple of years? So that was a really disappointing result. You, you probably remember Laurel Stratton who took the diatom class in 2010, I think. And then she did her thesis to try and see if she could recognize uh, the medieval climate anomaly where this low stand occurred because we had all these medieval climate trees that were had drowning ages of like 200 years. And we, we hoped we could see something in the diatom record. So we looked really close and then we looked again we just really didn't see anything. But then the little ice age just kind of popped up right above it. <laughs> and it was really easy to see. And so I think it really comes down to the sensitivity of the system. It might be subalpine systems overall, but it, it might just be fallen leaf flake because if you look at what a 30 meter drop will do, it's really not gonna change um, the littoral zone depth or, or the shallower depth enough to create a robust littoral zone. And it was sufficiently oligotrophic at that point so that um, you're not gonna get a lot of periphyton anyways growing around the edge of the lake. So uh, you had these steep sided glacial valleys and the lake size didn't really change by the drop. So one might say maybe it's the geometry of the lake. Uh, maybe it's the flow through, uh, it's not really gonna change. Uh, it's, it's a very low specific inductance. It's like 20 micrograms, it's really dilute. So you're not gonna really change things like salinity or, or some of the, the normal features when, when you have precipitation deficits. So it just might be that this particular system was just unfortunately not very sensitive to drought and other systems might do better. Yeah, I think, you know, this is just a wonderful record um, having, you know, integrating, um, you know, in the, in the other lake, the Goldman, data, and then your own um, modern collections to be able to understand what's going on in a lake on a seasonal basis, and then relate it to the sediment record. I just think this is just beautiful work. And it reminds me too of, um, of Platt Bradbury um, and his work on Elk Lake, um, being able to really understand the ecology and what it looks like in the sediments. Um, Tom has a question about, do the diatoms you counted preserve equally well? Um, are there species pres present in the modern assemblages that are not preserved in your sediment quarters? Uh, Euro Selenia ariensis, um, of course, was uh, really important in the spring and then I have never seen one in the sediment. So yeah, there's definitely some weakly silicified. On the other side, uh, there's Asterianella formosa, which is also, um, what's interesting about Asterianella and fallen leaf flake is it's not just a newcomer in the last hundred years like Castle. It was present throughout the whole late Holocene. And so 
even though it's there now, it doesn't seem to be a recent end deposition feature. We think that flushing from the upper watershed in the spring, bringing in a lot of nitrogen is probably what has spurred that thing for, for a while, but it's weakly solidified and we always worried about the counting. So we had to actually develop different counting methods for it where we would count the tips and then divide by two just to make sure that we weren't missing that. That was a real pain to worry about those things. Of course, you worry about all these things when you're counting, wondering <laughs> how biased your samples really are. It's a good question though. Thank you. I really enjoyed your seminar. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks. And Mark has kind of a follow-up question on the Styrianella. Um, he wants you to propose why Styrianella didn't take off in Castle Lake with the enrichment experiments um, as it has in the modern um, period of atmospheric deposition. You know, it might be that banana peel on the stairwell. <laughs> just you trip over it and you, you head right down the stairs. It seems like that experiment happened uh, about a decade into the real anthropogenically driven environmental change. And so it, it's really unclear to me how much of that top anthropogenic zone may have actually resulted from some kind of um, internal loading of nitrogen <laughs> from this horrible experiment that they ran. As to why Asterianella wasn't the first one that took off, uh, I think there might've been some kind of a succession with increasing eutrophication, but I don't know. And then one of the frustrating things about the data is our Asterianella spike in the, in the core happens in the last, um, two decades, and 1983 is when the limnology, the good phytoplankton limnology record stopped. So we, we don't really have that to compare. I, I wonder if it might have to do of when they dosed the lake in, in the 80s, if it, if it was a seasonal thing, I, if, if, you know, if a steering was done for the year and it just didn't, wasn't ready to take off when they hit it, so. I don't know. That's true. That's a really might, good point. That might be one of the one of the reasons. I was also thinking about whether the ammonium nitrate thing would be a would be a, a of consequence here too. And it would. What about um, really the and you know one thing you can fill me in because you're a geologist, Paula, um, of the source rocks in in Northern California that that phosphorus sources from volcanic volcanism in the more Shasta area than, than around Tahoe. Are those potentially N to P ratios could influence those responses? So um, Fallen Leaf Lake has a little bit of meta, meta sedimentary rocks and metavolcanic rocks, Jurassic metavolcanics, in addition to the typical granitic rocks that you get throughout the rest of the basin and up in the Sierra from the batholith. Um, I think some of the calcium that we saw in some of the detrital fractions in the XRF might have been related to the, to the bedrock geology. But in terms of phosphorus, I guess there are some, some metavolcanics that could have done that. We certainly see that in Lassen Volcanic Park, the work that Kerry Howard did. I think there's a lot of phosphorus coming out of those, those basalts. And that could definitely play into it. So the watershed geology could be a could be a big factor too. Um, Laura has a question: um, How could ratios between species um, give us clues about seasonality, knowing the constraints of relative abundant counts? I'm not sure I understand that one, but I think I I think I do. And now maybe I math this wrong and I just got it wrong and someone who has a mathier brain could do it better. But after I completed my 500 fixed counts, I went back and I just counted the two species of interest relative to each other, thinking that way I could eliminate, you know, the Alakasira effect. Uh, and I was actually disappointed because I was expecting this, this you know, drought signal to pop out and it, and it just really didn't happen. 
So I don't know if it's just Fallen Leaf Lake was not sensitive to it, but that was my workaround to avoid this problem of relative abundance. The other thing is to then triple the amount of processing time and, and get into the, the business of spiking your samples with, with um, those little microspheres. Does anyone do that here? The microsphere work? Somebody jump in. I can say I I gave it a valiant try, um, and I was not really successful at getting the kind of um, sensitivity and repeatability that that I thought it deserved. Um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna call you up, Paula, so we can chat for a while. Okay. <laughs> um, we're coming up on the top of the hour. Does anyone have? Any more questions uh, for Paula? Um, and either way, I'd like to have, we got a few suggestions for um, topics for the next, uh, the 2022 uh, Diatom Academy. Um, if you haven't put in some thoughts, please um, put in some, uh, voices for topics, even if you want to second someone else or, or add something new. Um, okay, Paul, um, Sylvia asks, given the long-term scale of lake histories uh, that we can infer from sediment cores, how would you approach informing lake management about reference conditions in lakes? Um, I think, you know, just kind of uh, getting out there and getting the message that, first of all, you have to do species level work. You can't just uh, fudge it when it comes to the diatom work because uh, we do species level work on every other part of the aquatic ecosystem. And if you don't know what's living there today, and if you don't know what species were living in the past, then heavens, how can you ever get back to the baseline level when you don't know what it was and you don't know what you have now? I think that's the big message. Anybody else? Okay, well, if not, um, please join me in thanking Paula for a really excellent seminar. And um, thank you to all of you for joining the Diatom Web Academy and our last session of the year. And I hope to see all of you in next year. So take care and uh, be in touch. <laughs>